Welcome, everyone, to the Asian Voices Radio Podcast, where you'll find real Asian American conversations about all things, including the topics you were too afraid to ask your Asian parents. I'm your host, Hula Ramos, and joining me today is someone you heard on episode 15 of the Asian Voices Radio Podcast. Please welcome back, Sheena Yap Chan. How are you doing, Sheena? Hey, Hula. I'm good. Thank you again for having me here today. I'm really honored. Just been busy, you know, doing stuff. I mean, <laughs> you know, just, just doing the work <laughs> and helping, you know, our Asian community elevate our voices. I know the month of May was Asian Heritage Month, but, you know, we have to go beyond that, right? Yes, we get a month where we celebrate the achievements of our Asian community, but, you know, I believe we celebrate it every single day and keep speaking up, especially with what's been going on in our Asian community. You know, we're still getting attacked, our elderly is getting attacked, and it just breaks my heart every time I see it online or read the headlines. Absolutely. No, I, I appreciate uh, your efforts. And, you know, obviously, you know, us Asians, we're, you know, taught to be very quiet and don't talk about our dirty laundry in front of everybody. But I love people, you know, Asians like you who are out there and being very vocal. Um, and, and I'm glad that you're able to join us on today's show. And you personally know our guest today. So on today's show, we're taking a deep dive into Korean dramas, aka K-dramas, and how they can aid with mental health. And today we have Jeannie Y. Chang joining us. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist and the founder of Your Change Provider, a therapeutic practice founded on solutions and cultural competence in promoting good mental health and wellness. And we're going to take a whole deep dive into K-dramas and how that helps out with mental health. So please welcome Miss Jeannie Y. Chang. How are you doing, Jeannie? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Hula. Super excited to be here. And of course, being with my gal pal, Sheena. Super excited. Absolutely. No, we're, we're excited to have you. Let's just start off from the beginning because I know you're a second generation Korean American and you were born in Seoul, South Korea. You came over to the U.S. as a little baby. And I found out early on that you too struggled with your identity like many Asian Americans. So let's just start there. Can you share your journey with us? Sure. First of all, I love the fact that you did your research. So yes, I was born <laughs> in Seoul, came when I was a baby, basically four and a half months or so. Uh, so pretty much identify being American Korean, right? But in recent years, this is where I'll, I'll start backwards with where I am with my Korean American identity. I'm super proud to share more openly, and I say it early on from the get-go, as that I am a second generation Korean American. But you wouldn't have heard that from me, first of all, growing up right? Saying it, I would say it in a very sheepish or embarrassed way. And then the fact that now it's a big part of my work to share my Korean American identity and then use it, of course, in my clinical work to normalize mental health. I mean, as you were doing your intro, talking about mental health, where, I mean, this May was also Mental Health Awareness Month. So those are right. two powerful intersections for me. Um, and I share that because I've come a long way. As a lot of us do, right? As we right. age and, and just get more comfortable in our skin. But it really wasn't until I honestly became a licensed therapist, which came later for me in life. Technically, it's my third career. So, and I really believe, and I always share, share this, but mental health, the field of mental health found me is what I always like to say. It's not something I planned, not because of the stigma or anything like that, just because I had hopes and dreams of honestly um, being a number one broadcast journalist, you know, doing these podcasts early on, right? That was my dream to be a well-known news anchor. And I really was well on my way at one point, but and I share this, it's, it's really odd how it happened, but in my early 20s, which now if I saw Jeannie Chang in my early 20s, I say, hey, Jeannie Chang, you're in burnout. But I was burned out, even though I loved what I was doing, which is why I'm very passionate about helping Asian American professionals because we don't recognize signs, right? So right. early on, I loved my career, but was unhappy. So it's like that dichotomy and that polar opposite emotion experience that I always tell people about that you can have. But I made a choice, which I think was radical. At the time, I so identified with my job, but I was like, you know what? I am going down a road that I see myself not good in like 10 years. I was actually con concerned about my well-being in 10 years, meaning I would have made the choice to look good and be successful, but was it what was it going to be at a risk of, right? So I actually right. left the field. And when I told my parents, Here is, here's where we go with the Asian American identity, of course, they're all like freaking out, right? Oh my gosh. <laughs> 
you worked so hard to be a journalist. They were proud of me, which is great, but that's because I was going to be famous. Right. And I was going to be like number one journalist. And I covered at the time President Clinton. I worked for the Associated Press. I was really doing well. But that doesn't matter when you're not happy. And so I I chose my well-being, my mental health without knowing that was my mental health. And I left the field. And of course, I was like, OK, I'm going to for I remember taking a temporary job in public relations. But I remember my my parents being like, what are you going to do? And I went, you know, you're right. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, I can't be a career dropout and not look good. And you know, that's where I bought into the whole, the stressors of looking good as an Asian American. So I did eeny, meeny, miny, mo. what am I going to do? And I went to business school. <laughs> so for the wrong reasons, I went to business school to look good. And, and I admit that because I work with a lot of Asian American youth and I like to share just being very authentic, why I made those choices. And it really was about being that all Asian, you know, buying into the whole modern minority myth, right? Not not purposely, mm-hmm. but just being like, oh my gosh, I have to look good. I don't want to disappoint my parents. So there was a lot of that. And I went to business school and of course hated it. But but I'm sharing this because my identity journey, really, obviously I share with people, mental health is linear. Your identity journey is linear. Nothing is, uh, sorry, not linear, cyclical. <laughs> my bad, <laughs> cyclical. So nothing in mental health is linear, Right. So everything is in a circular process. So where, why I share my diverse career path and how it got to me where I am is because all of that makes up who I am today. And I share that with folks for them to relate to how their mental health and identity intersect throughout all different seasons of life. And even though I disliked business school at the time and saw no purpose, but just was like, oh my gosh, I'm just trying to look good and just get through it. I, I use it now. For my advantage of running my own private practice, right, marketing my my work in the, in the sense of marketing where I have to just convince clients, obviously Asian American, and I basically work a lot with the API community. Now I want to share my private practice, which is huge to, sh- to say this. It's 100% Asian American. For me wow. to say that, yeah, that's huge. Mental health. Asian American community. Now, not necessarily Pacific Islander, because I would love to include Pacific Islanders, but in in North Carolina, in this area that I'm at, there's not a lot. So it's definitely Asian American. I'm proud to say that. And actually, I got very emotional about that earlier on this spring when I realized my my private practice had turned 100% Asian American. Because don't forget, the stigma in our community is pervasive. Now, when you talked about Korean dramas, that's how that all came into play. I my whole identity journey, business school, journalism, and then deciding, and this is when I decided to go back to school, much to the chagrin of my parents, my parents and my, my husband at the time, he was like, really, really? You're, you're what? You're going back to grad school. I go, yeah, it's not business. Yeah. I I can't be doing this for the rest of my life. I'm not happy. And I just always made the choice, honestly, to choose what gave me purpose and joy. And yes, that's cheesy, but that is a big part of mental health. So I work with a lot of Asians and say, Hey, what gives you purpose and joy? So I chose that raising four kids, I will share this. I had four kids at the time, ages six and under, or maybe it was six and a half and under. I was in a fog. I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. So I'm a stay at home mom right now, but I know that I have a passion and purpose to do more after I raised them. Cause I really was happy staying at home, raising them. And then I decided, you know what? I'm going to grad school. And then I remember my, my husband was like, oh my gosh, what are you going to go to grad school for? I go, I'm going to find my purpose. So it took me about two years raising my kids to find my purpose, kind of really being introspective, looking within, going, what do I, am, what am I good at? What do I enjoy? What can I see myself doing? And that was mental health. And it came to me at two in the morning. And I just, I just woke up and I went, oh my God, that's what I need to do. I need to go into clinical therapy and I need to be a family therapist because I'm already raising four kids. I understand family. Plus as an Asian American, the family system is like core, right? And I wanted to right. study it. And then I wanted to just really, honestly, counsel other families. And I was thinking in my head, not at the time, just serving Asian Americans, honestly. But in my graduate school program, that was like my therapy. So that's part of my story. When I went to graduate school, I went, oh my gosh, everything's starting to make sense. Asian American identity and mental health. And I had to, and I uncovered a lot. And then, and then basically, yeah, the rest is history, but how Korean dramas came into the fold was really by accident, um, as a lot of things in my life are. But really, it's because um, several years ago, because, uh, okay, so what year was it? Maybe 2017 or 2018, I've been watching K-dramas for many years. I would say college, post-college, so many years off and on, and then revisited them when my kids were a little older. So it, it'd probably be about 15 years consistently now. And I remember I was trying to get through 
to this family. This is the actual case study that started it all. And it was, this is where it's frustrating. When I'm a second generation Korean American and I'm treating other Asian Americans that remind me of my parents, Hula and Sheena. So it's kind of difficult sometimes when they remind you of your family and you're like, "Uh uh-oh, you know what I mean? Because it can be triggering. But I just remember it was very difficult. I was butting heads with the with the parents in the sense of trying to get them to understand their daughter, you know, and then just really getting to what was happening. The daughter was not doing well. Um, her mental health, in fact, they came into me in a crisis, mental health crisis. So, long story short, I don't. I wish I could tell you how it came about, but it came about somehow. And I brought in honestly, an example of a Korean drama because I asked him, Hey, do you guys watch K dramas? And the parents were like, yeah, I thought, which one are you currently watching? And it happened to be a couple that I was watching and I was like, okay. And I had to just do some thinking, but I just remember going, I'm going to, in my head, I went, you know what? The next time I see them, I'm going to give them an example of a K drama to help them understand some mental health issues to help them connect with their child. So that's how it all started. I'll stop for a second. <laughs> yeah, it, ha- it happened by accident just to get these parents to understand the teen at the time. And let me tell you, it did work. And that's where it stuck. And I went, interesting. Because, and plus, it was fun. Because at the time, I, I mean, I love K-dramas now, but I was really loving the fact that I was like, oh my gosh, am I bringing K-dramas into my work? Well, okay. You know? And it worked. Well, uh, well speaking of that, like, did you just realize that the parents all of a sudden opened up a little bit more when she brought up the K drama thing? Oh my gosh. That's a great question. Yes. So I don't know. And I was, I'm, and I was trying to rack my brain going, why did I actually ask them about the K drama? But I think at the time, again, it was to the point where there was frustration because they weren't getting my point. And, and I'm very direct as a therapist. So I was being very firm on things and I was really trying to help my identified client, which is actually the team. And there are tears. I mean, this is, this is like a very contentious therapy session. There were tears on both ends from everybody in my session, aside from me, but probably being my, behind my eyes were tears of frustration. And I brought up the K-drama because I remember doing some flashbacks as I was talking to them going, oh, there's some great family scenes. And I felt like this was like a deja vu scene that I was having with them. And I think that's how I tied in a K-drama. So I, when I brought it up, yes. When I brought it up immediately, the connection was like quick. I mean- the teen was like, yeah, I'm watching this. And it was nothing the parents were watching, but the parents were like, yeah, well, we see them all the time, you know? And, and they were looking at me going, you watch them too? I go, yes, I do. And I didn't tell them I needed subtitles, but you know, I was like, yes, I, I watched them, but that is how it started. And then yes, the following week I started and I kid you not, we broke down some K-dramas together and that's probably the most special case to date because that's what brought up all of this and how I saw change only because it helped them relate to what I was saying. Culturally speaking, there was such a divide that I needed to bring something in to help them watch and visually see and go, oh, oh, okay, now we see what Jeannie's saying. Awesome. Well, thanks, Jeannie. And, you know, I love, I always love hearing your stories and especially, you know, watching your videos on Nunes Nucci, uh, tying in mental health and K-dramas because mental health is such a huge topic that's still very not talked about in the Asian community or still a huge stigma. And of course, we always talk about how, you know, a lot of people still are feeling stress, you know, especially with Asian communities, we're feeling the stress of the pandemic and the anti-Asian hate. So it's, you know, twice as much that we're dealing with. And there's been studies where I think even the the racism is more stressful than the pandemic. Yes. Um, in fact, in our, in our field, we say racism is a mental health issue. It's a mental health crisis. It's a mental health issue across the board. We're talking discrimination, hate, microaggressions. I mean, think about, uh, anyone challenging who you are, even if you yourself struggle with who you are, as Hula was talking about, because we all have, that doesn't still matter because it's still discrimination and comments and biases that you face that are very distressful. And I will say, and I, and I'm, I, I think that's important for me to say with Nunez Nunchi, my YouTube channel, sure, I don't specifically tie in racism because I'm talking about K-dramas, right? But, and I'm talking from a mental health perspective, but I will share this. On a side note, that's a little bit outside of the therapy room and outside of perhaps just my clinical work, on a bigger global scale, K-dramas are, you know, are really infiltrating audiences worldwide because of the pandemic, right? People being stuck at home home last year a lot, watching things on Netflix. 
that I have found so much solidarity through the experience of watching Korean dramas and talking about it with non-Asian American Pacific Islanders, that's super powerful. And I'm sharing this because that's another boost of why I have found K-dramas to be very effective in addressing mental health. Because again, racism, mental health crisis, mental health issue. And I found that when I brought up K-dramas, regardless of the audience, I mean, there was always like somebody that watched it, right? I mean, I kid you not, there's nobody that went, oh, I never heard of it, don't watch it. No, there was always somebody in an audience that watched it. And I was just floored when I'd be like, wow, I don't see race when I'm talking about K-dramas and neither do these people that are non-Asian. That is fascinating, actually, because, you know, being Asian, you know, I'll be honest, I, you know, I, I know that your YouTube, t- YouTube channel is Noonchi's uh, I don't even know what that means. First of all, what does that even mean? <laughs> sure, I love, love yeah, Nuna's Nunchi. So Nuna in Korean means older sister. Yeah, I'm trying to be all coy, like I'm all young and all that. But um, you know, I I was really trying to find a play on words because Nunchi was the word that I really wanted to use. Nunchi is a very unique Korean word, and it means honestly, in simple terms, reading the room or reading someone's energy, knowing what's going on without using the words, you're watching things, you're observing. And that's what I do as a therapist, right? I don't just ask you questions and then get these answers. I have to observe what's going on in a family, see what I'm feeling, see what, what the emotions that are coming out of these folks, that's nunchi. And I use my nunchi all the time as a therapist, but nunchi is also that Korean term where, you know, they have this sharp look, they can recognize what's going on. It's actually a skill and Koreans will tell you it's a compliment if they go, oh, you have good nunchi. You know what I mean? But if they say, yeah, your nunchi sucks, that's a really bad compliment, right? And I will say growing up, I did get compliments as much as I disliked being Korean, that I got good compliments from my parents and even elders saying, oh, Jeannie, you know, you have good nunchi for someone your age. So I recall feeling that nunchi was something I had, but I still resented the word because I, you know, anything Korean I hated. <laughs> so just to be honest, right? So me now looking at me saying that I'm Nuna's nunchi, that's why I said I've come a long way. And I say it proudly and I'm sharing it proudly with you, Hula and Sheena, the meaning of this. It's really meaningful for me. That's amazing. You know, you, you it's fascinating me right now. I'm sitting here because you said, you know, there's all these different uh, racist uh, cultural groups that can relate to the the K dramas. I'm going back to there, and and it surprises me. In your professional opinion, is it because of the sur- the the surge of K pop? Like, is that what you think led to K dramas, or what do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think it's twofold. Definitely the surge of K pop, because I will say a lot of my friends that are non Asians will definitely say, yeah, I got into K dramas because of you know I don't know. Let's just say um, Chan Chang Wu is one of the uh, famous stars from True Beauty. Um, he is one of the, a K pop star, right? So they're like, oh, because him. Him. He's so cute. So I wanted to see him in a K drama. So yes, most folks, or not most, let's just say half the folks I talked to came over, switched over to K dramas because of K pop, and they're still K pop fans. But, but what hooks them in? Because hello, I mean, they could just go over K dramas and watch and be like, ah, eh, it's okay, right? And still say K pop fans. No, but what they do is that they switch over to K dramas, stay K pop fans, but they're like, oh my gosh. The, these K dramas are amazing. I mean, they'll say things like, "What is there not to like? The stories are amazing. The acting is awesome. The production is fabulous." But then, what what really hooks them? And I'll share this: is that they relate. So I kid you not, because Nunos Nunchi, I love talking to people. I love hearing the stories from folks, especially Black Americans, African Americans, Nigerian Americans. Oh my goodness, that share genie. No, I I don't see Korean or Asian when I'm watching a K-drama. They just watch the K-drama, relate to it, because it reminds them of their own upbringing and identity, period. Isn't that amazing? And they're not looking at race. They're not going, oh, that Korean, yeah, different than me. No, they're just looking at the fact that that story or the, the character development or, you know, the plot of the, the whole story of the family, they're like, that's my family. And so that's what I mean by race is not an issue when it comes to K-dramas from my work. This is based on my work. And and based on your work, I, I know that you talk about this thing that really stuck with me. It's the idea of Chung. Can you explain that to our audience? Because that really got me. Yes, Chung. Um, and again, I'm still marveling that I'm having this conversation on Asian, Asian Voices Radio about how pride, proud I am about Korean concepts. <laughs> because again, <laughs> I struggled a lot with my identity. But 
Jung is another unique Korean term. Wow, it's hard to describe, but I would say it is the rich connection among people. It's basically interrelationships, intra-relationships. I would say it does not just come within families, but there's such kinship, almost like a kindred spirit. You know, that term of like, you just feel this connection, almost like a soulmate, but then you're friends. And the Jung is so visible in so many K-dramas. That's what makes us cry. I mean, we're seeing the Jung and we're going, wow, look at that grandma that is a stranger to this little kid, takes him under her wing, you know, and literally doesn't know who he is, but feels sorry for him. And there's that Jung, meaning that affection and love that comes out of just um, relationship building. And that that's what I mean by Chang. And again, I hope I'm describing it, but it's really powerful. And that's what, when you watch it, again, boost to your mental health because relationships are super important to your well-being. And when you're watching this unfold in a K-drama, it's really good for your mental health to connect in that way to people you're watching on screen, but then watch these relationships show so that show that Chang, that kindred spirit I'll do anything for you. The loyalty. I hope I'm describing it well. I mean, it's really, really rich, really rich in emotions. Okay. Okay. Well, let me ask it because Sheena's here too. And she, she, she loves K dramas. Uh, was Sheena, what, what was your first ever K drama or what's your favorite K drama? So two part question, Sheena. Yeah, for sure, Hula. So my first K-drama I saw was Crash Landing on You. And I've never cried so much for a TV show. I was like, (laughs) why am I crying so much? You know, the Kleenex is like right beside me. I've probably wasted like used like five boxes every episode. And it's like I'm just bawling my eyes out and having a heart attack at the same time because I don't know what's going to happen. And with me, when it comes to K-dramas, I actually like reading the ending because I just can't take it. So... (laughs) So I have to watch, I have to read it. And my friends like get so mad that I read it. And I'm like, listen, I I can't take it. It it gives me a heart attack, (laughs) especially when you watch something like Crash Landing on You for the first time. But when it comes to favorites, I have so many. I mean, Goblin was one of my favorites. Uh, A recent one that I just saw was called Move to Heaven. That is an amazing uh, storyline about Uh, trauma cleaners and also unfolding the stories of the people they do the trauma cleaning for it just has a very great storyline and like what Jeannie said you know all these things are relatable whether you're Korean or not or you know from a different culture or even a different Asian background we all can relate to it we all can relate to the pressures of you know being perfect and obeying our parents and even when it comes to like going to the best schools what are you willing to do to get there right sometimes we tend to lose ourselves just so that we can have that name or that uh, status. So let me ask you this, Jeannie, um, because um, I, I'll be quite honest with you. I'm not too familiar with K-dramas because like I said, I'm Filipino and I grew up watching P-dramas or the Filipino dramas. And my wife is um, Hispanic and she watches all her telenovelas. And with those, um, compared to American soap operas, the telenovelas and the Filipino dramas always ended like it wasn't a long like you have general hospital you have one life to live you have all these american soap operas so can you explain is that the same with k dramas yes correct yeah totally that's actually why people love it because there's an ending it usually ends in what 60 to 20 episodes normally so you know it's going to end yes exactly um so they're very similar and i and i will say telenovelas p dramas c dramas they're all relatable. And again, I obviously don't have the time to watch all of them, but I probably would because I bet you I'd find re- relationships in all of them, right? Or be able to tie them all with mental health. But I focus on K-dramas because that's that's actually, honestly, and I forgot to share this, it's my main source of self-care too. I It's not just I just brought it into by accident because, oh, let me just bring this in to connect with you and um, use it for my clients. But I, again, am practicing what I preach because I will literally watch K-dramas for my own mental health to escape and just to enjoy. But what I think is amazing, and just as you talked about identity and the struggle we had all growing up with being Asian American or Asian and just struggling with that was the fact that I find it so relatable to now. But I will say when I was w- watching my parents watching it, my grandparents watching it, I resented it. I was like, I don't care about watching this these Korean people on screen, right? It's like, I'm already seeing myself. Why would I want to see that? I want to feel more American. I want to be white. That's really the truth. The, the truth. But now- I crave it because I, I, you know, I kind of rejected it for so long. Rejecting is like a kind of a, it's a strong word, but probably true where I'm catching up, if that makes sense. So when I came back into it 15 years ago, 
I really was like, oh my gosh, what? I'm missing this. I love hearing the language. But yeah, this is my big part of my self-care. So when I promote it to my clients, of course I convince them because I'm like, listen, your therapist is telling you that she watches this <laughs> for her own mental health. So I'm giving you homework right now. You need to do it. No, I don't talk like that. But um, but it is a big part of my self-care. Well, speaking of your clients, so so you know, I'm thinking, let's say you're a family therapist and you have, you know, your parents who are very traditional and conservative or whatever have you, and they have the the traditional values. And then you have, you know, let's say a teen who is struggling with their identity and going, you know, trying to be quote unquote, the all American, you know, so, so to speak, how does a K drama relate for each side? And then how does it bring them together? I love that. Yes. Yeah. So I will share. It's interesting a lot of the adolescents, so ages 12 to 18 and young adults have the same or similar identity struggles that I did. And I think that's interesting. Now, I, as a therapist, you can't always self-disclose too much and just get too personal and tell them, oh, let me tell you about how I grew up, right? That doesn't really, it's not about me, but I will share to help relate both sides of the coin. So I'm talking to parents and I'm also talking to the teen or the adolescent or the young adults. And don't forget, even families, uh, there could be adult children that come in with their older parents. But how it all ties together is someone's watching a K-drama or they're watching different K-dramas and that connects them already. But I use both angles because the whole point is you're watching a K-drama and you see as an audience what happens to every character, right? For instance, a mom yelling at her daughter saying, you're not good enough. That might be the typical Asian scenario there. And you see it in the K-drama and you're crying for the daughter, right? You're like, oh my gosh, mean mom, right? But then you don't see what the daughter doesn't see in a K-drama is she's bawling saying, my mom's disappointed, I'm a failure. And she goes off. And then the next scene is you see the mom bawling her eyes out because she just doesn't know how to share, show her love to her daughter. That's just an example, right? But as, a, as an audience member, you're watching this going, oh my gosh, look, daughter, the mom is just miserable. She just doesn't know how to show her love for you. That, the, that is what I use to tie the family together saying, listen, kid, I know you, this. that's why you're here. We're going to work on better communication. We're going to try to break, break these unhealthy patterns in the family. That's, that's my job to help you do that. However, I need you to understand this example of the K-drama, AK, whatever. Um, here's the K-drama. I need you to look at the fact that I know your mom's yelling at you and you're feeling that pain. But I'm wondering if maybe your mom just doesn't know how to share her love to you. And maybe she's this mom in this example of the K-drama crying behind the scenes. And then the mom's like, and then I kid you not, there was one scenario where this mom is actually really a dad in real life. But the, the, the parent was literally tearing up as I was sharing this because I said, am I right, parent? I'm assuming you struggle telling your child you love them. And then you go and you're really tortured because you just didn't know how to do it. And <laughs> That's actually accurate. So that's how I make those connections because I'm just assuming it's not me being a genius. It's really what I'm seeing through these K-dramas, breaking down what I see in my own work through the family and really believing it to be accurate. And I see, I just see the ties in the K-dramas. I have to find the right scene, obviously, but that's how I, when I watch them, that's what I do. I find them. What, you know what? You, I, I think you are a brilliant person to identify that this something as simple as a K drama, not saying that K dramas are simple, but just something <laughs> as unifying as a, a television show can unite and help with people and their mental health. And there's so much more we can talk about. I know our time is pretty restricted, but I would love to have you come back and join us because there's there's a whole gamut of things we can talk about in regards to so stress, many. anxiety, you know, therapy. All, <laughs> trust me, yes. I need a therapist and I wish you were in San Diego because I, I, I would love to talk <gasps> oh. to you because um, you're amazing. But um, real quick, I'm going to ask both you and Sheena, it, you know, someone like me, because I want to do my homework. What is the one K drama I need to be watching right now. We'll start with you, Sheena. Uh, I like Goblin. Goblin's one of my favorites, plus my favorite actors in it. <laughs> uh, his name is Lee Dong Wook. But um, you know, a, lo a lot of Filipino shows also are based from K dramas. One called My Love from the Stars that's based on a K drama. They also have the Filipino version of it because uh, the Philippines loves you know Korean culture, like K dramas, K pop, everything. So yeah. <laughs> I say Goblin is a really great one. Jeannie? Yeah, Goblin's a great one. All right, Hula, as, as she was talking, I was like, okay, let me go through the bazillion list. I will say Reply 1988 
That is actually one of the K-dramas you'll see on my YouTube channel that I talk through a lot. It breaks down so well the family, friendship, love, neighborhood culture in the Korean, in, in Korea. But yeah, Reply 1988, it's actually on Netflix. But I will say it is oh. one of the top, besides Goblin, it is one of the top five K-dramas of all time. So Sheen and I are, are choosing correctly here. It's really okay. literally top five of all time. Perfect. I've got Netflix. I'm going to, that's the first thing I'm going to watch is Goblin <laughs> and, right, and Reply. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, absolutely. Next time you come back, test me. But real quick, where can we, you know, if we want to find out more information or just follow you or find your YouTube channel, where can we follow you? Sure. Yeah. I'm on Instagram. Um, your change provider is my, my professional Instagram and Nunas Nunchi is also on Instagram. But yeah, follow me on YouTube. I, I would love it. Uh, watch on YouTube. Let me know what you think. I love comments. I'm starting to follow more people that will give me recommendations on what they want me to analyze, and I will do that. So Nunez Nucci on YouTube, y'all. Perfect. And we can have you back, right? We're saying Yes, now. of course. Happy Ab to be back. Absolutely. So thank you so much uh, to the both of you for joining us today. I would love to thank our guest, Jeannie Y. Chang, for joining us. And to learn more about today's show, please visit AsianVoicesRadio.com. Also, if you have any suggestions for future topics, we'd love to hear from you. Also, be sure to subscribe as well as follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And until next time, I'm Pula Ramos. And on behalf of my co-host, Sheena Yap Chan, we'd like to thank you for listening. And please join us next week for another exciting and thought-provoking Asian Voices radio show. Take care until next time.